Hi, I'm George Dugdale, and I'm going to show you a video on how to uh, put up crown molding in your house. A lot of homeowners ask me, um, you know, how to do it, or I've seen a lot of homeowners attempt doing it with uh, some pretty uh, strange results. I've seen crown molding that's been put upside down. Uh, I've put it, seen it flat on the wall, um, and I've seen it also you know, where the every corner is caulked heavily to try and mask the inability to. Uh, cope it correctly or miter it. Uh, what I have here in this house is uh, two-part crown molding uh, with four and five eighths uh, crown um, mounted on top of a three and a half inch uh, base molding that's inverted, that's placed upside down. Uh, first thing I'd say on this whole thing is after you buy your lumber, um, your, your, your trim, uh, bring it home, put it on sole horses and prime it and paint it, at least one coat uh, before you do it. That way you won't have to uh, be on a stepladder going around the room um, priming, painting, and putting a finished coat of paint on. One thing you see with this two-part molding, uh, the, the inverted base is laid flat against the wall. Crown is an extended molding. It is put at an angle to the wall and ceiling. Uh, this particular crown is 38 degrees off the wall, and I have a pre-made um, piece here that shows you that this base goes and gets nailed flat against the wall and this comes off. Uh, being that the crown molding is a, an extended molding requires a compound angled cut. That's a cutting an angle on an angle. Um, the flat molding is not that same. It's just you cut a 45 degree angle uh, and that it, it's that simple. Um, on the, uh, we're going to talk about uh, out, outside corners and inside corners. Um, and we also have splices along long walls where you're splicing two people, two pieces. And that is it. That's all you need to, those are the three different types of cuts you'll uh, have to make. The between corner joints on long walls, when you have a wall that's over 16 feet long, um, you're going to come up with something like this. and. Uh, this, if you'll notice, is, uh, I haven't even 45 that. You, you don't want to butt the two pieces together at a 90 degree angle. You do want to angle it a little bit, but it doesn't have to be 45, 20 degrees, something soft, because the longer the angle, each piece of wood is slightly different, the, the, the greater uh, the tendency to, for them to be off a little bit. So put it at a 22 degree angle or something and cut it. And I would say that this particular joint is a good example of... Uh, uh, why you want to glue it. This has been up for a couple years. It's heated, it's dried, um, and it's separated a little bit. Uh, so always glue these joints as well as you go. What we're going to do is talk about uh, finding your uh, two by four studs in the walls and finding the uh, ceiling joists in the ceiling. Um, this is a good example. I'm working on a bathroom right now where we furred over the existing sheetrock, but this is a good example to show you that um, the uh, Studs typically in a wall are spaced at every 16 inches um, and once you find one stud uh, you can pretty much mark off 16 inches on your tape measure or on the piece of wood you're actually putting up and go from there. Basically I'll just take a small finish nail and a little bit down, tap it into the sheetrock and if you hit air behind it you've missed um, and you could take your hammer and tap on the wall listen for a, uh, a harder sound you find your stud or you can use a stud finder um, and that way you can you have to nail into a stud if you're nailing into the sheetrock it will not hold um, the same goes for the ceiling you have to find the ceiling joists in a room ceiling joists will run one way and this in this room they run this way so every 16 inches I have a joist that's coming in I'm going to want to nail into those on this side of the, the room I don't have joists that are coming this way. There's one here on the end, and there's probably another 16 inches in from the corner. What I will do on the, this side of these, this, th these sides of the room is uh, nail up a cleat that I can first, that I can nail to my, my crown to later. Uh, that way it'll hold. Um, the, the next way uh, before I start actually putting material up or cutting material is I want to go around my room and mark off how far down the wall uh, the crown and the inverted base uh, come. And 
in this case, this is actually, I have this turned upside down. The bottom is actually the top of the crown that's going to hit the ceiling. And this down the wall, uh, you'll see it's about three and five eighths or so um, from the top of the ceiling down the wall. I'm going to mark out the, on the wall and especially in the corners uh, that space. And what I've done, so I don't have to take my tape measure, is I've taken uh, just a scrap of plywood and cut it to that three and five eighths plus the distance that the, um, the inverted base is going to come down. And that whole combined distance is this. What I'm doing right now is I'm going around the room and imagine that this is all sheetrocked. And I'm going to mark, especially in the corners, uh, the distance that's down from the ceiling down to the bottom of where my two-piece molding is going to be. Um, I'm going to do that in the corners because uh, you have the ability to roll your material to make your, your, your joint fit tighter. We're going to cut it perfectly, um, perfectly angled for the molding. But what you want to keep in mind with any room with sheetrock on framed lumber is the surfaces are not perfectly flat, level, or uh, even. Um, so we're going to have to adjust to the room. Um, and these marks will help me keep uh, the uh, crown in the right uh, area. I'll, uh, it'll be a reference mark to, to, to shoot for. Downstairs we, we talked about the uh, mid wall splice on a long wall and we covered that. Uh, the other two uh, cuts we have are the outside corner and the inside corner. Now this is an example of an outside corner. Um, it is a miter cut. Uh, this is a compound miter cut again because it is an angle on an angle because this is an extended molding. It does not sit flat in the wall. Um, this is, I've gone ahead and glued and bratted this together to show you, uh, you know, what it is. Um, I'll even, to some people, all the crown moldings come, they're not all the same. They don't sit 45 degree off the wall. They sit different degrees off the wall. Um, but when you're done, regardless of how, how off the wall it sits angled wise, your outside corner needs to be a 90 degree angle. So if you are setting up your chop box and you put your two pieces together and you don't have a 90 degree angle when they're perfectly put together, you need to readjust your chop box. Uh, I'm setting up my chop box for a compound cut and for this particular crown molding I'm at 34 uh, degrees right there on that angle and I am at 32 degrees on this angle. Um, now, uh, we, there is a common mistake that people make is uh, cutting it the wrong way. You kind of have to visualize what your, what your end product is looking for, uh, what you're looking for in your end product. Uh, on an outside corner, your top edge is longer and it's back cut on both both coming from the left and from the right. Uh, so that's what we're going to visualize on this. Many times people make the mistake, they put it on, they cut it, and they're like, ugh, that's the opposite of what I should have done. So kind of visualize what you need. This is going to be, a, I'm cutting part of an outside corner, we're back cutting it, and the top is longer than the bottom. Okay, you want to hold your piece flat, flat to the deck and... And uh, we've just cut this outside, half of this outside corner. It's a, it's a miter cut. Um, and as you can see, that's, uh, your, your job is half done there. Uh, the, then you repeat the process, but you have to change the angles on the saw to get this side uh, for the other side. Uh, the outside is a miter cut. The, um, on short pieces, like over mantles or cabinetry, where you actually have a short piece, I will tell you to go ahead and pre-assemble it like I've done for this demonstration. If you had a 12 inch wall here, uh, pre-cut this, cut this, glue it, nail it, put it aside, and then put it up as a unit. The small short pieces um, are unadjustable uh, to, to deal with the ceiling. So you want to make sure they're perfect before you put them up. The long 16 foot lengths or long pieces, you can actually torque and twist to get them where you need. The short have to be pre or should be pre pre-made, it, it works better that way. 
What I've done here is I've placed the piece of trim that I just cut back on the miter box so you can see the orientation of the, the trim. This is the top of the molding. Uh, we had the back cut going this way. That set us up uh, for half of the outside miter. Uh, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take the other side of the miter and place it on the saw. Now notice I'm going to be putting not the top towards the, the fence, but I'm going to put the bottom towards the fence and then I'm going to rotate my table angle to 32 degrees going in the other direction. Now this has been pre-cut uh, and you can see that uh, this is the correct situation for the other, other side of the outside corner. What we just completed was an outside mitered cut. Now to do inside corners, uh, you don't do a miter cut. You could cut it uh, like on the on the uh, chop box and get the perfect angles but what happens is on an inside cut as you nail to uh, the drywall on both the corners that that inside corner is going to come apart and you'll never get a tight gap. The way you overcome this is you cope a piece of trim back cutting it by hand to match up to a uh, an existing uh, piece of stock that's put in butt cut at a 90 degree angle um, and you can you'll have a coped corner that as you nail it will stay tight uh, uh, tight to itself um, and what I'm going to do actually the first thing I'm going to tell you is the, the, it's a little more difficult and at the same time it's a little easier the first piece is easier because basically the first piece you just put up just with a regular old butt cut. You just put it up there. Let's say if the room, if this room was 12 feet long and this piece was 12 feet long, you just nail it up in place and you're done with that piece. The, the piece that joins to it is a little more difficult and I'm going to show you how to do the coping. First thing you do is we're going to make an angled cut uh, on the chop box. So we're cutting the, uh, setting up for a coping cut with the miter box and again the, uh, on an inside corner the top part of the crown is going to be shorter. The cut is not going to be a back cut to the trim. It's going to go this way. The back cutting we're going to do by hand with a coping saw. And another thing I might say is um, always start with a sharp blade. This is not a sharp blade. You, want to, you don't want this to happen. Uh, I've been doing a lot of framing and uh, for this uh, video we have a dull blade. Start with a very sharp new blade. So I've just cut this in preparation for coping and cutting this out, this profile here to match. Uh, this, is the, this, would be the finished, this would be the finished product of what this is going to be. So here is, we're gonna, this is a coping saw and it's a very flexible blade. And I'm going to back cut this profile uh, all along this edge here. So I come up with a, a, a face that perfectly matches the piece that's already up on the wall at a 90 degree angle. The one exception to that is uh, I'm going to take this first part and just go right at a 90 degree angle. I, you could follow the paint line on this first triangle, um, but it, it's so paper thin it breaks before you're done. And um, this 90 degree butt for this short piece uh, is um, probably done more than not. It's perfectly acceptable and uh, so we're going to start here. What I like to do is get that 90 degree angle cut and then I break that away because the rest of my cut I'm back cutting severely. To, uh, you know, um, Because any wood that's sticking out past this profile and when you look at the profile this way, you, 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 you want to make sure that it, there's no wood behind it that's sticking past or else you won't get a tight joint. So everything's uh, like a very deep back cut. So my, my angle of my saw is going way back past the back side of the, uh, um, the material. And you're going to want to uh, have a sharp coping saw blade as well um, because this is, uh, you know, it's, it's tough. Uh, if it's dull, and it splinters, so it's good to have a sharp blade. You want to constantly, you want to stay along that line, the paint, the difference between the paint and the new cut, 
and you constantly want to be thinking about back cutting. And you know, when you're back cutting at this point, you're going this way. And when you're further down here, you're going more underneath that way. And uh, you don't have to go start to finish. In fact, I like to, you know, work with the material and the, the, um, the profile. I'll, I'll come up this way and follow that paint line. And then you just get rid of that material there. And then uh, we'll just continue and finish this whole thing and hopefully it'll fit together for a shot. One of those things is, uh, if you do it every day and you're doing it, uh, you'll have the knack for uh, how far to cut back. You know, you, uh, I haven't done it in a while, so it'll probably take me two or three pieces before I can just cut it in the first pass without having to trim up a little bit. And then I'm not going to try and curve around and come down that line. I'm going to stop, pull back, and then back cut to meet it. Now we splintered that out because this saw is dull as well and that's not good. Typically I'd start over again if that happened. Okay. And this is the back cut. We don't see any of that, but that's to give you an idea of you want to be cut back. So this is the piece we just coped, back cut. And what we're going to do is, this. the purpose of this is to, so when you put this up on your ceiling, uh, that it has a nice tight joint right into the existing piece. Um, the idea is, and it's very, you're very capable of doing it, is getting a, a, a tight joint that you don't have to caulk. Uh, you don't want to use caulk if you don't have to in this joint. Uh, you know, the, uh, like a sign of failure is when you, you, you go into a house and you see heavily gobbed caulk in the corners. That means they didn't quite get it. Um, so that's the, um, that's how you miter an inside corner. Uh, one thing I would say is in measuring this piece, you cut this and you measure when you take your, let's, this is on the ceiling. You're going to measure from this point to your next corner. Um, and then you're going to hook your tape on here and the other end will be cut, it'll be a butt cut, it'll be a 90 degree flat cut to that next corner. When you're doing crown, you go around a room. You start at one point, you go around a room clockwise or counterclockwise. Actually, if you're lefty or righty, you'll, you'll, you'll realize which way you want to go. Um, and um, the last piece you'll either end on an outside corner, which is convenient, or if you end, the last piece will be, if it's on an inside corner, you'll be doing a double cope. You'll have this left side will be coped, the right side will be coped. You will measure from here to there, assuming that that was like an inside cope a cut, and then you just, you snap it into place, um, and it should fit perfectly, and, uh, and that's all there is to it.